Hi, Bill Box here. Welcome to our program today. We are going to bring into your home some of the best jazz available in the world. And we have some terrific people who are going to play it for you today. As we salute and welcome back to New York, the incredible Newport Jazz Festival in its 26 years. <laughs> sound of Jerry Mulligan. Hi, Jerry. Hi. Nice to see you. Uh, Jerry Mulligan, I, I, I don't know how I could describe your sound except very mellow. Thank Makes you. me feel mighty good. And you're working in front of a tremendous, very young, powerful big band now. That's true. And touring around with the group? Yes. Yeah. We'll be playing with the big band at the uh, show in uh, Saratoga on July 1st. July 1st. And how about with the jazz festival? On the festival in the city, I'll be doing a, a show that uh, Mel Torme and I are co-producing. Uh, the, the salute to the American Songwriter Night. That'll be good. We do some of the stuff that I saw you do at Carnegie Hall with Torme a couple no, months back. No, Mel is going to do, uh, let's see, I think he chose to do Jerome Kern mm -hmm. songs. And we're going to do a segment of uh, songs written by jazz musicians. Good. For instance, uh, a lot of writers that, uh, that were, were, a lot of players who had one song that was really well known. You know? Good. For instance, like uh, What's New, a song of Bob Haggart's, the, bass player, Misty, Errol Garner, and uh, we'll have Vic Dickinson and, and uh, as a trombone player is going to sing, and uh, Doc Cheatham also, a trumpet yeah. player. We're going to do the best we can with the with the jazz player songs. And when will that be again? That's the on the, uh, that's the 26th, I believe. 26th? No, and... 29th. Well, we're, we're it's clear one of those. When Mrs. Ween comes out. Go ahead. Oh, a couple <laughs> things. You, when you were in sixth grade, you were playing the clarinet. Right. You started out on the piano. Why did you settle, settle on this instrument? What? Nobody told me I couldn't. That was it? <laughs> More or less. I don't know. I, I, I started with the clarinet and sort of worked my, then I went to the saxophone and worked my way down. And what about this specific instrument? Where did you get it? How old is it? And how come it has spots and stuff all over there? Looks like you could use a little brasso on the outside. I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a new one. Uh, the new one I'm going to get is built about two years after this one. Really? So and when, when was this new. built? This is about uh, middle 20s, I guess, about 1925, 26. And who had it before you? Do you have any idea? Yes, this was uh, uh, at, in a hotel in Minneapolis, probably from the day it was born until the day I bought it. And it would just was passed from one band to another, you know, like one, as the bands changed. This was the doubling horn, so it never had to go out and face the world. Well, well the thing is, Jerry, what was there about this instrument? I mean, you've obviously been playing it for a long time. Why did, why did you settle on this instrument that had been living in a hotel? <laughs> well, I was lucky to get it. I had uh, another horn that was very similar to this. And uh, I was on a tour with uh, Duke Ellington's band, and m my quartet was appearing with uh, Duke's band. And uh, my horn fell apart one night on stage in Pittsburgh. And I played on Harry Carney's horn for, for a couple of nights. And he said, wait until we get to Minneapolis, because there's a good repairman in Minneapolis. So I did. And we went into the shop together. And there were two musicians from the hotel. And they said, oh, we have a horn just like that at the hotel. I said, I, good, I'll buy it. And that, so that so was does, it. The outside, it doesn't make any difference. If, no, it's. I mean, uh, this, if you were in the Army and that was your belt buckle, you'd be in trouble. I'd be in trouble. But I'd doesn't... be in trouble anyway if I was in the <laughs> yeah, Army. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> All of us, I think. We, we're, not, we're not going that way. Hey, how about uh, the collaboration? between the two of you. You had never really played together professionally before, correct? Right. Together? This is our debut. All right, so this is like a musical encounter of the first kind. Shall we encounter in Georgia? Hell, why not? <laughs> you have Georgia on your mind? I have Georgia on my we'll mind. We'll do it. On my mind. <laughs>
works. You did it. Thank you. I like that section you were doing in there. It reminded me of a piece of Duke's. What was it? That's, that's, uh, that's uh, Brubeck's. Oh, they, he called the Duke. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Duke, right? So that's a nice I brew back, yes. yes. Bobby Short is just not another pretty voice. <laughs> <laughs> he can play it. He really can. We got a couple people in the questions, uh, people in the audience with questions, right. I believe, for Jerry Mulligan. First up, man without an instrument in his hand. Yeah. Hi, I'm Louis Tucheron. I'd like to ask Jerry uh, how he could compare the state of jazz in 1979 as regards public acceptance and state of talent as, say, like 1949, like the birth of the cool, et cetera. All right, you got 30 seconds. I can do this in 30 seconds? <laughs> Take your time. That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> well, the state of jazz uh, today as compared to 49, there are so many good players around today, and uh, a lot of musicians have had the opportunity to, to go to, uh, to colleges and universities and uh, music schools that uh, are much more widespread than they were in those days. So I think for actual equipment, the actual uh, technical ability of, of the uh, musicians today, the younger musicians especially, is probably superior to the, uh, to the training that, that we were able to get in, in uh, earlier years. Uh, on the other hand, talent is talent, and there's always uh, plenty of that around. There sure was a lot of around in 49, and uh, I hope that uh, 79 is as lucky. Okay, next up with a question, please. Yes. Uh, my name's Arthur Randolph. I'd like to ask Mr. Mullen. Why is it that everyone in the audience says sounds like a musician? Their names and their voices sound like <laughs> Arthur Randolph, right? Yeah, I'm not a musician. All right, go ahead, Arthur. Uh, most young musicians coming up uh, have a, a positive uh, idol or someone that uh, had a positive influence on them. And I was wondering uh, if you had one and who it was when you were coming up. Oh, yeah, I had lots of idols. Duke Ellington was one, and Harry Carney, and uh, uh, a lot of the men that played with the band were, were idols of mine. Plus Charlie Parker, Louis Armstrong, Art Tatum, uh, Jimmy Dorsey. Um, just they, they were so many models that, uh, and that, of course, that's the reason I got involved with music in the first place. It was just, uh, it was just a great cornucopia of marvelous possibilities. When you were 19 years old, you were working with Gene Krupa, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Playing as well as writing with Gene Krupa. Yes. What kind of a, an influence was Gene Krupa on your young life at age 19? Well, he was, a, a very, was very lucky for me to, to play with his band because uh, Gene's interests in music were uh, very broad. He, he introduced me and a lot of the other members of the band to, to his favorite uh, symphonic music. Uh, he, he loved to play. Uh, Ravel was a great favorite of his, and, and he always carried a record player with him, and, and uh, we would we'd get together every chance we so you, could on the on road. So you were on, on the road, road at age 19 then, right? Oh, yeah, I was on the road before that. <laughs> As an arranger, I was the... Uh, uh, I arranged for Tommy Tucker's band. And uh, when we were doing one-nighters with the band, of course, as soon as we get, out of, get, get to the hotel, I was immediately inside, where's the piano? <laughs> because I had to write three arrangements a week. That was tremendous uh, experience then. Oh, yes. Obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a quick break. We're coming back with Eddie Palmieri, Tito Puente, and more questions from the audience, and obviously a lot more music. Will you play us out with something? Certainly. That's not too much to ask, to hoist the axe one more time? What would you do? How about just a touch of something Cole Porter? <laughs> 